Hello, everybody, and welcome back. It is time once again for the Jack Wagon Sports Podcast. We hope you all had a great holiday season. Uh, we have a great show for you guys today. We have a huge announcement, though, that we want to get out of the way to begin. Uh, we have officially partnered with our first sponsor. Uh, it is Dubby Energy. Uh, if you use the code Jack Wagon, uh, you get 10% off your order at W.GG. It's not W.com. Uh, W.GG. You head over there. Uh, we've, Slade and I have both had their products so far. I mean, not, no real complaints. They're actually pretty good. Uh, very excited to be partnered with them. Uh, so we wanted to get that announcement out of the way. So we hope you guys head over there, get that checked out. Uh, it's a lot of fun to be partnered with somebody for once. Uh, and we're excited to see where this goes from here. Uh, but yeah, W.GG, head over there and use code JackWagon for 10% off your order. Uh, very excited to announce that with you guys. Uh, and without further ado, let's just go ahead and let's get right into today's show. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, NFL, college football, and a little bit of golf today as well as the, the official PGA season, as I like to call it, gets ready to kick off. Yes, they've had a few events already. Uh, they did their holiday break, and now they're getting ready to start with the uh, Century Tournament of Champions this weekend in Hawaii. Uh, for me, this is kind of when it really starts to begin, and even then, not really. Uh, I, I kind of consider the Farmers Open in California the first huge event. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. We're, t- we're talking too much. Uh, let's go ahead and let's talk NFL. Um, week 18 is coming up this week. It's crunch time for a lot of teams. Uh, it's it's going to be do or die for a lot of teams in the NFC and the AFC as well as we try to see who gets into the last wild card spots. Um, of course, the big news this week, we would be tone deaf to not even talk about it at all. Of course, the terrible incident with DeMar Hamlin on Monday Night Football. Uh, first of all, thoughts and prayers to him and his family. We hope that he continues to have a safe recovery. We've been getting good news, uh, and it's getting progressively better. Hopefully it continues to get even better from there. Uh, so we, we wish nothing but the best for him and his family. Um, talking about the NFC side first, though, uh, it, it's a three-horse race to see who gets into the playoffs uh, for the last wild card spot there. The Packers have the slight edge because if they beat the Lions, they're in. Uh, the Seahawks need the Lions to win, and they need to also win. And the Lions need to win and the Seahawks to lose. So kind of an interesting situation there. Uh, Nick, your thoughts on this whole setup for the NFC wild card? Yeah, so uh, right off the top, if I'm picking one of those three teams, uh, I have to go with Seattle here. Um, I like the fact that Green Bay just needs to win to get in, and they're at home. Um, However, Seattle partially controls their own destiny, too. Uh, When it comes to sports, you kind of got to control what you can control. You hear a lot of coaches talk about it. And if you're Seattle, the only thing that you can control is winning this game. Um, You win that game in front of you, which I personally think that Seattle can and will do. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, well, if Seattle wins, Detroit's kind of out of it. If you think that Detroit is going to go into Green Bay, their divisional opponent, week 18, and not try to ruin Green Bay's chances of going to the playoffs, uh, you're stupid. I I don't know know what other word to use. Um, This is a Detroit Lions team, uh, especially under Dan Campbell, that's going to give Green Bay everything that they can handle and then some. Uh, They're going to look to be, like I said, ruining Green Bay's playoff chances. Um, and, you know, I, I think that they do it. They have caught a lot of uh, momentum here towards the end of the season. You know, the first six, seven games of the season, they looked like a team that could be good, but their defense didn't really step up. Now they have the offense playing efficiently, the defense doing their job. Um, so, like I said, I think Seattle takes care of business early on, and then uh, Detroit is going to finish Green Bay off uh, from the nighttime. Uh, so you, your thoughts on, on the NFC picture? Yeah, so I think that it's really crazy that each team basically needs the same thing. Aside from Green Bay not needing anyone to lose to clinch their spot, I mean, they realistically, they all got to win. They, they're they all going into the game knowing that this is down to this game. Like a lot of times, you know, it's week 17, that's the game. Like, oh, we got to win this one and next week. We're already past that. We're at this point where, I mean, they all need to win. And they, other than Green Bay, obviously, they, they need the other team to, to win. But uh, yeah, I think it's it's. I'm more interested to see how the number one seat goes with the NFC here. I think that it's going to end up being Seattle that comes away with this spot. I think that Green Bay is going up against a really good Lions team that they had so many close losses at the beginning of the season. I mean, their record could be so much better had they not had so many of those close losses. So I think that they're an underrated team playing Green Bay this week. Yeah. Um, for my pick, I think – the team with the best chance to make it is Seattle just because they're playing a kind of down Rams team. I, I mean, as far as where we thought they were going to be this season coming off the Super Bowl, we thought 
Yeah, you know, it's Super Bowl hangover, but they still should have been a lot better than how they played. Um, Baker Mayfield has really started to play really well in that system now that he's got adapted to it. Uh, and so that is definitely something to watch out for as well. I mean, it's not going to be a cakewalk for Seattle by any means. Um, the team I think most likely to walk away with that playoff spot, though, is Green Bay. Uh, it's just, just kind of the season they've had. They've shown spurts of greatness, and then they've shown that they can be a really terrible team overall. Uh, here the last few weeks, they've put together a little bit of momentum. Um, I, I, this is – they just had the feeling around them that this is going to be the team that sneaks into the playoffs after – you know, we were sitting here four or five weeks ago going, there's no way the Packers make it. Um, again, they're, they're playing a home game. It's at night. It's in Lambeau. I think that's going to be the edge. I would love to see the Lions win, the Seahawks lose, and the Lions get in. I, I think that would be a great story. I think the Lions have just let too many chances slip through the fingers. If they beat Carolina on the road and then they won this past week, they're in the playoffs. Uh, and, and, you know, we're talking about they need to lose and Seattle wins and so many other things happen for them to get knocked out. Um, and I, I think – Again, again, as great of a story as it would be, it's kind of time for reality to set in for the Lions, where, yeah, those are, those close losses early in the season, those are the difference makers between getting into the playoffs and, and sitting at home next week. Uh, and, and I think they're going to feel that sting. It, it might be motivation for them to go out, pick up a couple more players this year, and come back and put together a complete season. Because at times, this Detroit Lions team has looked like a team that could possibly go on a playoff run. But again, I, I think they've just let too many opportunities slip through their fingers, and it's going to bite them. Uh, and I think we're going to see that this week. Again, I think the Packers, just with their momentum they have, the, the situation they have is, listen, win and we're in. We don't have to worry about anything else. Uh, playing at home, I think it's going to be enough for them to sneak in. Uh, we flip sides. We go over to the AFC. We look at that picture. Uh, who would have thought, again, four weeks ago, we're sitting here talking about the Steelers making the playoffs. Uh, Mike Tomlin has his team at 8-8 eight and eight again. If they win this week, he will once again not have a losing season. Uh, if we get to the playoffs or not, we, we shall wait and see. But it's going to come down to the Patriots, Dolphins, and the Steelers. I believe if the Dolphins win, they're in. I, I, there's like 30 playoff scenarios I've, I've seen. I the Dolphins need to beat the Jets and the Patriots to lose for them to get in. Okay. I can read off the four things quick for you if you want. Yeah, uh, so ahead. the Patriots need to beat the Bills, and they need the Dolphins and the Steelers to, to lose. So that's an or, either or. So the Patriots need to beat the Bills or – if the Steelers and Dolphins both lose this week, they make it in. The okay. Dolphins, as we already said, they need to beat the Jets and they need the Patriots to lose. The Steelers need to beat the Browns and they need the Dolphins and Patriots to both lose. And the Jaguars can lose to the Titans and with losses to the other teams, they'll still make it in. Um, it, it's a crazy, crazy way of events that the Patriots are still <laughs> – the easiest path it seems because they just need to win or have two of the other teams lose. Right. Um, yeah. Like I said, I mean, just between the Patriots and, and you think again, four or five weeks ago, we were sitting here looking at the Steelers going, Oh, they're going to scrap their whole team. You know, they're looking at a top 10 draft pick and so on. And here they are. They're actually fighting for a playoff spot. Um, Kenny Pickett has finally started to develop a little bit of that offense and, and shown Signs of how good he really can be now. Are they going to continue to do that? We'll have to wait and see. I'm not sitting here saying Kenny Pickett's a huge draft success or anything by that stretch of the imagination. I, I think he still has a long way to go. So does that whole organization. I think I, I, I think the Dolphins have wasted way too many. I think they're on, what, a six, seven-game losing streak right now. Um, you have Tua Hurt, and now I believe Teddy Bridgewater's out as well. Uh, so the, uh, the whole quarterback situation is not in favor of the Dolphins. I think there's going to be a lot of finger pointing at Mike McCarthy already. Uh, that's not his name. <laughs> Mike McDaniel's. Mike yeah. McDaniel's. I was like, Mike McCarthy is not the coach of the Dolphins. Um, yeah, there's, there's going to be a lot of finger pointing at McDaniel's already. Listen, he had this team at one point in position to be the number one seed in the AFC, and now we're sitting here talking about they're not even going to be in the playoffs. I don't think they win this week. I think the Dolphins are all but done. Again, with two quarterbacks out, it, it makes it almost impossible. Um a lot of squandered opportunities. Uh, again, I, I don't think all the blame should go on McDaniels. Uh, you know, you, you can only help injuries so much. But there, regardless, no matter what happens around your team, there's always going to be a finger pointing at the head coach. Uh, we're going to talk about head coaches here in a minute. Um, the Patriots, I, again, I worry about Mac Jones in pressure situations. Yeah, he's looked really good at times this year. But a lot of those times, it's, hey, this is just another game. Let's go out there and let's play. Uh they're also playing the Bills. And, again, this is if this game doesn't get canceled, we shall wait and see what happens. Or if, you know, the Bills decide to just take a forfeit or 
nobody knows what's going to happen with that situation. But regardless, if they do play, they're going to be a very determined team to go out there and, and play well for their teammate. They also still are fighting to lock up the number one overall seed. Again, we have to wait and see what happens with that in the Bengals. Um, so that's going to be a very high energy matchup for the Bills. I believe they're at Buffalo as well. So that crowd is going to be rampant. I think the Patriots are walking into the most dangerous situation. Believe it or not, I think the Steelers have the easiest path here. They're, they're going to play the Browns, who just got eliminated last week. Are honestly a complete dumpster fire, if you ask me. Deshaun Watson, he finally threw a couple good passes last week. Still, he does not look very good at all, in my opinion. Um, and I don't think that Browns team is anything special. Uh, so... <laughs> believe it or not, I believe the Steelers have the best path to get into this wild card spot. Uh, but yeah, Nick, Nick, your thoughts on the whole AFC playoff situation? Yeah, so I'm actually going to go ahead and agree with you on this. Uh, I, I think that the Steelers have the best shot, uh, the easiest road, so to speak, to that playoff spot. Um, they, they just have to beat the Browns, which uh, the offense of the Browns is struggling way too much uh, to really compete against the Steelers' defense. They might put up some points. Um, the big question mark really is Pittsburgh's offense versus Cleveland's defense. And despite a couple pieces like Garrett and whatnot on the Browns' defense, I think that the Steelers move the ball enough and score just enough points. Probably going to be a low scoring, like 20 to 17, something like that, if it's even that high. Um, but I like the Steelers in that game. And like you said, Miami, being on your third quarterback <clears throat> – is not, you know, even though they are at home, it's a very tough Jets defense, a very good Jets defense. I don't think that your third string quarterback gets it done, no matter how much offensive talent you have around him. And then, yeah, New England uh, going on the road against what's going to be a very emotional Bills team, a very good Bills team, still the favorite to win the Super Bowl. Uh, I, I just, I like Pittsburgh chances, Pittsburgh's chances. Mike Tomlin always finds a way, uh, you know, to go positive, as we've talked about plenty of times. Um, so really, I, I think Pittsburgh gets the job done and it, it's on the other two teams, you know, that they're competing against to get a win. And I don't think that either one of them have a good shot at getting the win. So I like Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, Slade, your thoughts on, on this wild card matchup? Or yeah. Race? So obviously I want Pittsburgh to win, um, but it, it's a short lived thing because they end up playing either the Bills or the Chiefs then the first round of like, I mean, it's just, it's difficult, but um, I, I think that. I personally think the Dolphins have the easiest ride. I think you guys have both mentioned that the Patriots are walking into one of the most hostile environments against the Bills. Um, I think that the Jets, I mean, they had like two good weeks of Mike White. And ever since then, I mean, this dude's throwing balls at the dude that's supposed to throw the ball in from the sideline. Like the guy that's the ball boy just carrying the bag of ball. Like he's throwing balls to that guy more than his receivers. So, I mean, I, I don't foresee them being able to beat the Dolphins this week. Um, and and the Jets, the way that they've played the last two weeks, is the reason why I think the Dolphins have the easier route. I think I, I think what we're going to see is the Chiefs get the first round by just because I think that the Bills are going to go in and they're going to demolish New England. But they're not going to be willing to play another game a couple days later against the Cincinnati Bengals. So I think that they're somehow going to forfeit both. They're, like I think that it's going to be a classy move. Both teams are just going to forfeit the game and take, like, somehow take a loss. I don't know how they'll do that, you know, but I don't think that they're going to end up playing that game. And so I think the Chiefs are, just have to beat the Las Vegas Raiders this weekend, and they're going to walk into the, the home field advantage. And I mean, we've seen it before. Patrick Mahomes is is damn near unbeatable when he's got home field advantage through the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, no, it's definitely going to be an inter interesting situation to see what the NFL does with the, the Bengals game. Um, with the Bills. Uh, but moving on, uh, usually the Monday after uh, the end of the regular season in the NFL is called Black Monday. It's when a lot of NFL head coaches get fired. Uh, in your opinion, who do you guys see as being the coaches that get sent packing on Monday morning? Uh, Slade, we'll go ahead and go right back to you. And who do you think is getting fired on Monday? So I, I don't really know that any of these coaches are really like deserving to get I mean there's been so much that has happened this season a lot of teams that were supposed to perform I mean the Jets were supposed to be really good but then you had just the decline from uh Wilson right is that his name yeah yeah I mean you just had the decline from him I mean the team just basically turned on him right away I mean they were wearing Mike White shirts the next week when they were starting Mike White and everything so I mean that that was just difficult for them I mean I don't think that he should get fired there at the Jets I don't think that 
Um, I, I don't think Mike McCarthy should get fired for the for the Cowboys because I mean their team is doing good. I mean they're they're sort of like the Chiefs in that they're flying under the radar. It seems like this season. I mean all the talk has been about the Eagles and the Bills, and then Cincinnati here is here of late. I mean, but I haven't heard much about any of these other teams. So I mean, for me, I, I have a hard time picking anybody that's going to lose a job right away. But I'm sure that you guys have some better understanding on the coaching standpoint from football and give us some better insight. Yeah, uh, Nick, I'll let you go ahead and go first. Yeah, so the first one, um, not going to lie, this is kind of a personal – I don't want to say hope uh, because I don't like to see my coach get fired, but I do think that after this season, Ron Rivera is going to be out. Um, I, I think it's going to happen one of two ways. Either A, Dan Snyder is going to say, look, you've had seven wins. I think he might have got eight wins last year. The year, year, Yeah, last year I think it was. Um, but either way, you float around even every season. Um, I have this thing, I call it the Ron Rivera strategy, is to start off the season kind of slow. Uh, during the middle of the season, go on some bullshit win streak. And then at the end of the season, when you have a chance to make the playoffs, you either A, fumble it away, or B, get in by the grace of God because some other team lost. Um, this year, we didn't make playoffs. Obviously, we were eliminated. Um, and I just think that the entire coaching staff, Ron Rivera, Jack Del Rio, Scott Turner, they all need to go. And how do you do that? You fire the head coach and let somebody else come in and build their team. Um, I will say there's been talk about Sean Payton. I'm not one of those, one of those commanders fans. I do not think Sean Payton is coming to the commanders. Um, I don't understand why he would. I know we have a talented offense and a good defense, but it's still somebody like Sean Payton. I, I don't, I don't Washington. I don't even think that it has to do with like how, how their offense and defense runs. I think that the struggle that is going to remain for their team is within the management. Oh, Dan yeah. Snyder and everything. I mean, I don't think anyone wants to walk in there and be the head coach, no matter yeah. whether they think they can take him to 13 wins, knowing that this team might get sold by the time exactly. they get so there. Like. That's the second option here is, uh, you know, there's talk where the, the sale could happen as soon as March. And obviously that wouldn't be finalized and everything. Um, but I learned about this thing that happens in professional sports where if you know that there's agreement for a sale or something, that new owner can kind of start to put his touch on things. Like he can start to say, hey, this coach is fired. This coach is coming in, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it, one of those two ways, I think Ron Rivera is gone this season. And that's my, um, you know, biggest, uh, he could stay. Don't get me wrong. But I, it, from a personal point of view, I, I think that he's gone this season. Uh, I just don't think there's any reason to keep him around, especially um, if the sale were to happen, you know, close to the end of this yeah. year. Uh, I'm, I agree with you as far as Ron Rivera. I don't I don't think he gets fired, though. I think he's more so going to be, listen, it's time for me to step away. He, almost like a mutual agreement, but they're going to let him leave on his terms. Let yeah, him leave with a little bit of honor, not necessarily fire him. Um, so and I, I do want to say real quick before you get started, like, I do, I appreciate where Ron came in. He, he was brought in to change the culture in the locker room. He did that by all means. I'm thankful. You know, you can only do so much when Dan Snyder is your owner screwing up. He's a good coach. He's, I think he's taken this this whole roster. So unless Washington wants to sit there, gut this whole roster again and go through a rebuild, which nobody wants to do because you have a lot of really good young talent there in Washington. Oh, yeah. uh, but Rivera has taken this team as far as he can get them. Um, and, and I think everybody around the league kind of realizes that. Uh, it's just up to if Dan Snyder, A, wants to fire him or B, Rivera kind of recognizes that and goes, okay, you know, it, it's time for me to hang it up. Do you guys think that he misheard the reporter this past week when asked uh, about a QB change with with them being eliminated? And he had said eliminate. What? So and like at, he, he, he had first, come out like <laughs> – like Yeah, at he's... first I thought he was like kind of being sarcastic because Ron does yeah. that in, in interviews sometimes. Um, but he had actually gone back when somebody had asked him about like him not knowing. And his reasoning was – well, I thought we were going to beat the Browns this week. So, like, whether or not you think you're going to win a game, that that's not a good excuse. So, like, I genuinely think he might not have known that we could have been eliminated just based off of, you know, that kind of retract that he gave, you know, mm -hmm. with that answer. So, I, that's another thing. Like, I, whether he's being real or whether he was being sarcastic, like, at that point in time, that's not really the point to be sarcastic. So, like, I, mm -hmm. I, I have my feelings about it, but I, I'd like to believe that he was being sarcastic, but I, I've come to the conclusion that I think he was he genuinely, whether it was because he thought he was going to win the game or not, he genuinely kind of already was. thinking ahead, thought that they yeah. had already beat the Browns. Yeah. I see what right. you're saying. Um, as far as my, my thoughts on coaches that are going to get fired this year, I think Lovey Smith is going to be gone from the Texans. Uh, I, I think that whole organization is ready to move on and, and hopefully start treating this like a real football team and not just, you know, kind of a project that let's build up some draft capital to just trade to somebody else. 
Um, I, I think they're they're ready to take this team to the next level. We've seen a lot of really good things come out of that roster. Obviously, you're sitting there at a 213 and one record. It's not the greatest, but at the end of the day, I, I think they are a pretty good team, honestly. Um, they, they don't have much leadership, though, especially in the coaching. Yeah, you don't have a good quarterback, but uh, I, I think Lovey Smith's time in, in Houston will be over. Um, obviously, Indianapolis is going to be needing a new head coach. I hope the guy, they don't think Jeff Saturday is going to be the head coach for a long period of time there. Um, other, I think Kevin Stefanski and Cleveland could be on watch. I'm not saying he's going to get fired. Um, and I think this year he'll probably get a break because, hey, you didn't have Deshaun for the whole year. And, you know, there was a lot of things going on. Um, but I, I, I don't think Stefanski is a very good coach at all. I, I think May, Baker Mayfield was his highlight and he got him to the playoffs. They won one playoff game. And then I, I think that's it. I think that's all you're going to see out of Kevin Stefanski. From here on out, you're going to see that flirt with the wild card, and that'll probably be about it with him. Um, but, again, we'll have to wait and see. I'm, I'm pretty sure the ownership's going to be like, oh, we'll give you one more year with Watson and, and see where it goes. Uh, I think Cliff Kingsbury is also going to be fired. I agree. Why he was ever hired, I have no idea. He, he Or why they signed an extension. Uh, yeah, uh, he, he basically flunked out of the college ranks with Patrick Mahomes because he couldn't win more than four games in a, in a season. He comes into the NFL. He has a couple good years to get started. Uh, but we've seen time and time again where this this Cardinals team just fall flat on, falls flat on their face. And, yeah, you can point at the, the Kyler Murray injury, but he wasn't playing that well to begin with this season. Um, and I really think that Arizona is fed up with Kingsbury. They're going to move on from him. He was supposed to be this quarterback whisperer because everybody thought Mahomes was a product to him. Uh, that was definitely not the case. Uh, and, and so I think we're going to see Kingsbury coach his last game this Sunday. Um, I think that'll be it. Now, I do think there might be two coaches on retirement watch. Um, I think Pete Carroll in, in Seattle, he might be ready to hang it up. Uh, he's, he's been there for how many years? He's getting up there in age. Uh, he might be tired of just dealing with the circus year in, year out. Um, and I'm staring. I can't think of the, the Rams head coach right now. Uh, but it was Sean, rumored. Sean McVay. Sean, I wanted to call him Sean McDermott, but I knew that was a Bills coach. <laughs> um, yeah, Sh- Sean McVay, uh, he – it was rumored he was going to retire last year after the Super Bowl, which I wasn't aware of. Uh, people have kind of alluded to how poorly the season has gone. Is, is he going to hang it up? Is Stafford going to hang it up? Is Aaron Donald going to hang it up? They, remember, they had to basically beg Aaron Donald to come back for the season. Um, and so I, I don't think the competitor in him wants to go out like he has gone out this year. Uh, but he might just be you know tired of tired of it, a little bit over it. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. But I, I mean, I think- and also, like, when you look at the Rams, it, 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 again, this is my opinion. You know, I'm not an NFL executive or anything like that. But when I look at the Rams and I think about how you had to, you know, beg Aaron Donald to come back, you know, Stafford, even though he had a good year last year, didn't start out the year good this year before getting injured. Um, when I look at the Rams, I'm thinking it, at the very least, if you're not doing it next year, in two years, you're talking complete rebuild. I think they should do it next year. Well, in, in uh, the difficult they thing, even. they gave away. Yeah, a I was gonna say with the I'm difficult not. thing. Look, and I think why McVay is looking at retiring is, I have to sit here. It's gonna be four years until we yeah. can start to do anything with this roster again because we have to trade everybody away. You know, they're we're gonna, gonna be looking them. like the Texans. They're, they're all gonna retire, like you're saying, Matthew yeah. Stafford. He'll retire. Well, I'm not. I'm not even just around. saying him. I'm just saying you, you still have other pieces on that team. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, not big names like that, but you know, there's gonna be guys that you can trade away. You're not getting first round picks for them. You're going to be getting second, third round picks, late round yeah. picks. The only guy you're getting first round picks for is Cooper Cup, and you know he's still young. It's like you. He'll be who they build people. around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, that, that's why I think he might be. Listen, I don't want to go out on, on this terrible season coming off that Super Bowl win, but I also don't want to sit here and have to go through this whole rebuild. Uh, yeah. I, I think if Stafford hangs it up after this season. Uh, I, I think McVay will as well, but we'll have to wait and see on that. But those, those I would like thoughts. to see. I would like to see Sean McVay go to college. I would like to see yeah, like him be... versus Lane Kiffin yeah, in like an SEC I, and I, and, time game. Yeah, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if these rumors are true about Harbaugh going to the NFL. I could see McVay going to a school like Michigan. Hey, this is a big time Power Five program. They're right there on the edge. I could easily go in there and, and push them over. Um, him versus and, Lincoln Riley, then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that's definitely a possibility if, if a big name college football spot opens up mm-hmm. like a Michigan, you know, where everything, again, is kind of established. He doesn't have to go in there and completely rebuild that program. Um, I think he definitely has the groundwork laid out to, to want to go in there and do that. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see. 
Um, moving on out of the NFL, we're going to talk a little bit about college football here today. Uh, bowl season is wrapping up. We only have the national championship game left on Monday, uh, which I'm going to be very excited for. Um, let's go ahead and look at Capital One Bowl Mania real quick. Excuse me. Uh, and these are the final standings, obviously, again, like we said, one game left. Um, so it's by picks, but it's, it's under the wrong name. So Jack Wagon Sports wins overall. Uh, our team picks actually came tied in second with Jesse McGee. Jesse's like to say that we, we cheated. I don't know how we cheated, but, I mean, hey. Yeah, because he said um, that we're not allowed to enter our own contest. Yeah, but we'll, we'll call him co-winner. Just, I'll, I will gladly hand him co-champion. He just wanted co-champion. to win. Yeah, yeah, I'll gladly hand him co-champion. That's okay. Participation. Um, but this is a lot of fun. Uh, shout out Dave Joy, uh, who did the same thing as Hannah last year, who entered and didn't realize you had to pick the games. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, shout out for that. But <laughs> seriously, uh, thank you, everybody who entered. It was a lot of fun. I, I, this is the first year I was constantly checking these standings. Yeah, uh, right. seeing how everybody was doing. It was it was a nail biting, especially coming down to the end. Uh, I mean, it went down to it came down to what the, the Cotton Bowl and the Rose Bowl there at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, very exciting things. Um, but looking back on bowl season, uh, we want to kind of look at some of the winners and losers. Now, this isn't just teams. This can be players, coaches, uh, or again overall programs. Um, Nick, I'll go to you first. Who do you have as your winners, and who do you have as your losers coming out of bowl season? Yeah, so uh, I picked one winner and loser as teams and one winner and loser as uh, conferences. So the first one, I would be remiss. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I'm not Google. Couldn't tell me if that was the real word or not. Remiss is. I'm not sure if remiss is, uh, but nonetheless, I'm using it. Um, if I didn't mention Penn State in the good category, uh, you know, we've talked about it outside of the podcast. Two stud running backs, an O-line that should, you know, once again, get better. Um uh, a belief in the fact that the QB situation is going to be better. Um, you know, shout out to Sean Clifford while we're at it. Uh, we've talked a lot of crap on him on here, but every good thing that's been provided to me from the Penn State offense under him has been mostly because of him and some ridiculous Jahan Dotson catches um, until this year when we got a running game. But nonetheless, um, and a star studded defense that's filled with a lot of young talent that really shouldn't miss out on a couple pieces that we're going to lose this offseason. Uh, Not to mention a coach finally getting his first top 10 win. Um, So you can't help but say the future is bright. I think that they look good. As far as my bad team, uh, I I was hesitant to say this. I almost chose somebody else, but I I went with USC on this. And, you know, while they still ended with a pretty good season, um, the way that they ended the season to me was very disappointing. You had a chance at the college football playoffs. You couldn't get it done. And then when you have a month to prepare and go out to play Tulane, albeit a very good Tulane team, and you don't get the job done, you let them come back on you. Uh, to me, you know, I yes, I know that they're still going to have a lot of key players around next season. But I just think whether it's coaching, whether it's players, whatever it is, the way that you ended the season isn't going to help you carry any momentum over in the next year. So you're going to have to, you know, kind of count on new players coming in and player development. I, I just don't like the way that they ended the season. So I had to go with them in the bad co- category. As far as conferences go, in the good category, I have to go to the SEC. Um, they continue to make their case as the best conference in college football. Between having the most teams playing in bowl games, the second best bowl win percentage only behind the Big Ten, um, which had two less teams play in bowls, and being represented uh, by the favorite in the national championship game, it's hard to argue that the SEC is, is the top conference. And then as far as bad, I went with the Big 12. Um, they were definitely on the wrong side of things when it comes to bowl season, despite having the other representative in the national championship game in TCU. Uh, if you take out TCU beating Michigan, they went one in five in all other bowl games. Um, I wanted to give them more credit because of TCU being there. And there's a lot of teams that competed against TCU in the regular season. But after seeing what TCU can do when they play four whole quarters, uh, which luckily they decided or they realized that they could do that before the game against Michigan, uh, it suddenly makes the rest of the Big 12 not look as good. Um, yes, Slade, even Texas. Sorry. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, definitely a huge disappointment. I thought the Big 12 would do a lot better, especially, you know, seeing how TCU did and the way t- they a lot of teams competed against them. But like I said, once we've seen what TCU can do with four quarters, it suddenly makes the rest of this Big 12 uh, look a lot more inferior. Uh, Slade, your thoughts? Yeah, so I, I think the best teams was, first and foremost, Alabama. I mean, we saw before their game uh, just probably 
more than a handful of their star athletes enter the transfer portal and decided they're not playing. Um, uh, after the game, Nick Saban had released that he gave every single kid that entered the transfer portal the option to play in the game, that he said that they said that they would play for this team for the year, that that was the last game of the year. They were allowed to play in it. They all chose not to. Um, the fact that they went into this game, and I think after losing those players, the, the spread should have been a lot closer than what it, that it, what it was pregame. But uh, to only give up two touchdowns in that game and score 45 was just a great way to end the season for uh, Bryce Young, who who had, I would say, a disappointing season for himself. I mean, he did have a good season, but compared to last season, I would say it was a disappointment for him. Uh, Tulane, I think that they ended this season on such a great note. This sets them up for next season. I mean, this is um, that Oklahoma State or – the teams that they have to do good the year before to even set themselves up for year two or year three of getting close to the playoffs. I mean, Penn State's in the same position. I mean, like, these are teams that they have to finish inside the top 10 the year before to have a chance at even trying to get to the playoffs the following year. And Tulane was able to do that. I mean, what a comeback that they had against USC. Like you had said, uh, PSU and Oregon both getting it done uh, was nice. And then just team that I, I didn't think – deserved to even play was uh clemson i mean i feel like they were just a disappointment um you're playing backup quarterback for tennessee i mean they chose clemson chose their quarterback over their starting quarterback that they had i mean obviously it was a good good pick the week before or the game before but i mean it it and the only thing they kept talking about is that it was the kid's first uh loss or something like that as a quarterback since like prep school or something i'm like uh, it's just didn't need to be what it was about, but I just feel like Clemson was was the disappointment. I'm glad they did not win that game uh, two games before and make it into the playoffs because that would have been really disappointing to see them play one of these top four teams that oh, we got yeah. to see and get the, their brakes blown off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to slightly disagree with you there. I'm, I'm not putting that loss on Club Nick at all. I thought he actually looked very well at times. I think that, that was Clemson as a whole came out and just looked terrible. Uh, they couldn't get him any time in the pocket. I saw multiple wide receivers dropping passes. Uh, he was playing very well. He hit a lot of his open guys. Um, I think Klubnik will be fine. I think it's a whole system issue at, at, at Clemson. Um, and, and so, again, yeah, it, it's not great. I just want to put all the blame on him. Yeah, well, ESPN I'm, not, was, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just – that ESPN was definitely overhyping. Yeah, it was, a, it was his show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was his show. Um, and, you know, a lot of people forget um, uh, Milton was a starter over Hooker before last mm-hmm. season started. Uh, and and – a lot of people were doubting him for some reason. He came out and he showed why Tennessee is in good hands moving forward. Um, my winners and losers, uh, my winning team, I'm going to give it to OU, uh, Oklahoma. A lot of people thought they were going to go to Florida and just get throttled by Florida State. I was one of those people. I thought Florida State was clicking on all cylinders. Oklahoma went out there. They were up for a couple scores early. They took it to the finish line. Uh, that was a really good game. Oklahoma has had a very good recruiting year as well. Uh, they're setting themselves up nicely for next year. A, a lot of people thought Brad Venables was going to be a failure. Listen, he took over this great Oklahoma team who, for some reason, last offseason, all anybody could talk about was the amount of people that left Oklahoma. Uh, and then this season, they were surprised when Oklahoma was struggling so much. Um, I, I think Oklahoma's in good hands going forward. I think Venables is a good coach. Uh, I'm excited to see where that program can go. If they can get momentum going before they head to the SEC in a couple years, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Uh, my my loser team is Florida. Um, I understand they had a lot of opt outs. They had a lot of trouble going on with the quarterback situation. Um, but the the team that showed up in Las Vegas was one of the worst football teams I've ever seen. I'm I'm still watching videos, you know, weeks later, of players just jogging down the field. A pass rusher just stood there as as a ball was that that team went there with no desire. I, I think they kind of knew they were going to lose, but. Nine times out of ten, when you see a team that's, you know, hey, we're picked to lose, nobody's believing in us. They go out there and they, they at least want to put up yeah. a show. A lot of these guys, again, are probably going to transfer. Hey, let me go out there and let me put some good film on against a really good Oregon State team. Uh, they just had zero desire to be in that bowl game. Uh, Billy Napier, who's a coach I really respected, um, is, is definitely losing control of this team. I am worried about where that, that whole program is headed. Uh, it'll be an interesting situation to watch. Um, a player I thought was a winner was Sean Clifford. Uh, I mean, again, going back to, yeah, we give him a lot of crap this year, but the way he played against a very good Utah team on national television where all the eyes were on that game before Monday Night Football, 
All the other bowl games were over. This is the only football game on. Scouts are going to be watching this. NFL GMs, executives, everybody, coaches are watching this game. Clifford goes out there and plays what I would call the game of his life. Uh, he, he threw the ball very well, ran the ball very hard at times when he had to. I think he boosted his draft stock. I think we're, t- we're all of a sudden now we're talking about this guy playing on Sundays. Um, again, how is he going to do in the NFL? We'll have to wait and see. I'm not going to come Christian on that Hockenberg. yet. Yeah, but I, I think he definitely boosted his draft stock this this week in, in his bowl performance. Um, I would have loved to see Cam Rising stay healthy in that game. I think it would have been a, a, a great matchup watching him and Clifford duke it out for four whole quarters. Um, and now, again, it, it's is uh, Rising going to go into the draft? Is he going to wait another year? He does have one more year of eligibility left. We'll have to wait and see with that. Uh, I saw a video of him talking to a to a teammate, and they were like asking him something. He's like, "No, nah, I'm not coming back." Yeah, I saw that. It was like right at the end. He's like, "He's like, no, nah, I'm yeah. done." So I don't know if you're talking about. I I don't know. Right. Um, my my loser player. I'm gonna go with JJ McCarthy. Um, listen, he talked so much crap this year. This is. I mean, I, I wanted to put Michigan as a loser team, um, but the way they fought back in that game, I just couldn't do it. They they talked so much leading into that playoff game against TCU, like. You know, we were just happy to be here last year, and, and you know, we we weren't expecting anything playing, you know, Georgia, you know, one of the best teams. This year, you know, we expected to be here, and, and you know, we're going to go out there and we're going to prove over here. And McCarthy goes out there, and he throws the two worst passes I've ever seen in my life. What, one, why are you throwing to the opposite field in, in a, a flat-out route, and you're not, you don't think the safety is going to come flying down to pick that off? Um, that's uh, high school quarterbacks. Don't make that mistake more than once. And I've seen him do it multiple times this year. I don't know why he thought he was going to be the guy to get that ball out there. His second interception, he had a dude wide open on the corner out, and he just stared at his wide receiver on the slant and underthrew it, and he got picked off for another touchdown. Uh, and then he does that thing where he stands on the field, oh, this is, this is going to be mean. And no, it's not. Um, <laughs> it, I, I can't but stand Stephon him. Stephon Diggs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, I mean, to be fair, Stefan Diggs didn't start it. If you think back a couple years ago when Cincinnati lost to Georgia, mm-hmm. I believe it was a Peach Bowl, uh, like a last-second field goal, Cincinnati players stood out there and watched it. And then that uh, later that year is when Stefan Diggs Made did it. So, yeah. so I, I don't want to hear it, Stefan Diggs. Um, my winning conference, I'm going to go with the American. We have Tulane beating a very good USC team. Um, Cincinnati did not look very good in their bowl game, but they're missing their head coach. They lost a bunch of, of you know, uh, transfer portals and, and NFL drafts. Um, but I thought they did very well in the rest of their bowl games, establishing that, hey, we are a very good conference. Uh, SMU, who, uh, again, a lot of people were looking over, were like, oh, you know, what, week three, 20 players said, yeah, we're not we're not playing the rest of the year. Yeah. Uh, and here they are. They go out, they win their bowl game. Um, and so I, I think the American Conference as a whole did very well. Uh, my losing conference, I put the ACC. Again, we just talked about Clemson. Uh, Wake Forest was like the only redeeming quality in my eyes for the ACC. Uh, UNC put up a better fight than a lot of people expected against Oregon, uh, but they lose that game late. Uh, and I'll say this one last time before bowl season's over. Stop playing bowl games on goddamn baseball field. That was one of the worst football fields I've ever seen in my life. And you th- I-, I watched it the night before as well um, when – Wisconsin played Oklahoma State at Chase Field in Arizona. Dudes are just slipping left and right. Stop doing it. It's not going to happen, but stop doing it. Um, you also had Syracuse uh, losing to Minnesota as well. So just not very good week or month for the ACC. Um, losing, I don't, I don't have a winning coach. Um, losing coaches, I put Sweeney and I put, um, I, I want to say Lane. Well, Lane Kiffin is on there as well. Um, we just talked about him. What's the USC coach? <laughs> Lincoln Riley. Lincoln Riley. There we go. Um, Sweeney, Lincoln Riley, and Lane Kiffin are my losing coaches. Um, these these are three coaches that have been gifted golden programs. Uh, Sweeney is just refusing yeah, to anyway. adapt. Yeah, Sweeney is just refusing to adapt to how college football is changing. He he had it timed perfectly, you know, with the, the dual style quarterbacks, and you know, let's put an emphasis on defense, and we're going to have some pretty good offensive players. Everybody else has done that now. And he, he, you can look at the quarterback situation, how you know up and down that was all year. I just think overall he's not doing a good job of getting his teams ready anymore. This defense came in. First, we watched this defense, the secondary especially, get torched all year. And somehow they're coming into the Orange Bowl with one of the best receiving cores in Tennessee. And everybody's like, well, D- 
Clemson's defense is what's going to win them this game, and then they didn't play you know, in the secondary at all. Um, you look at Ole Miss, they, they look like they couldn't care less about that game. Um, Lane Kiffin did a very terrible job of getting his team even prepared, and I said it going into the last two weeks after they lost to Alabama, you could tell that Ole Miss team didn't, did not give a shit about the rest of their season. Um, and so it, it's a bad luck for him. And then Lincoln Riley, we've seen this, and we said it last year when it was announced he was leaving Oklahoma to go to USC. He, he's not that great of a coach. Yeah, he brought in a lot of high-end talent, but obviously he's not doing something right to get his talent over the hump. We saw it with so many years with Oklahoma. He got them to the playoffs, and then they would just get blown out by these other teams. Uh, and now he's in a much tougher conference. He lost to Utah twice. Um, and then he plays a Tulane team. Again, Tulane is very good. They did, they deserve a little bit more respect than they're getting from a lot of people. But there was no reason USC should have blown that 15-point lead. Uh, and a lot of that is on how they were coached. Why that dude decided to pick up the kickoff on the two-yard line and think he could run it, I don't know. But um, just a lot of poor coaching. And I think that's more on Lincoln Riley than anything else. But those are just my thoughts. Uh, so there's our winners and losers from uh, bowl season. Again, the national championship will be on Monday. Uh, we will try and do one final out of the tunnel as a pregame show for that. Uh, so keep you, keep your eyes peeled uh, on our Instagram, uh, Twitter. I forget all the other social medias, Facebook, all of them. Uh, and we will let you guys know. Uh, moving on, our last topic of the night. Again, we're looking at the PGA season upcoming. Uh, again, a couple tournaments are in the books. Uh, but what are we most excited for? What are we looking forward to this year? Slade, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I kind of have three points that I wanted to talk about. First is Zalatoris. Uh, he's coming back. He ended the season with some pretty bad back pain, um, was having to take breaks in between walking to holes to kind of get his back rubbed out, get some heating pads on there, whatever he had to do. Um, he feels like he's really ready to go after a good resting off season. I mean, we realized that golf doesn't really have an off season. I mean, these guys have been away from golf for maybe a month, and now they're back. Um Century, I think, is what you had mentioned is this weekend. Um, yeah. There is some firepower going to this tournament. I mean, it's the best of the best. I mean, everyone not named Tiger Woods, it seems like, is going to be at this tournament. Just to name some big ones, it's Shoffley, Thomas, Rom, Fitzpatrick, Spieth, Scotty Scheffler, Max Homa, Victor Hovland. Like, there's, there's a lot of fi firepower coming to this. And so I think it's going to be a really good one to watch really early on here. Everyone's trying to kind of get a, a jump on the points to start the season. And uh, the last part that I kind of wanted to mention is I saw some news. I hadn't did a lot of digging on it, but that some of the uh, tournaments are going to be allowing live golfers pop possibly like, an uh, I know the masters plan. is. Uh, yeah. So I'm wondering what your guys' thoughts are on how um, this is going to mesh when it comes to kind of them talking to reporters and stuff when these tournaments happen like what what do you think is do you think it's going to be a live versus pga thing or do you think it's going to be like a no this is dustin johnson he's fighting for his weekend like do you think it's going to be like a team aspect where it's like the live golfers are out to to kick ass and beat all the pga players or do you think it's gonna be like nope dustin johnson doesn't care who he plays for what league he plays on he's here to win the masters no i, I think 100 percent it's going to be it, the live and no matter how the players try and spin it, it's this is what the media is going to push is, listen, these live guys are coming here. It's live versus PGA, and, and that's all we're going to hear all weekend. Uh, and I think regardless, it's going to get fed into the players too. Uh, you know, the live's like, I guarantee you there's, it's going to come out. Live is going to pay X amount bonus if they go out and they win the Masters or that, you know, they finish so many places above a, a PGA player. Um, and I, I think that aspect alone is going to make it PGA versus live. Um, and then Phil Mickelson getting sent home on Friday, which won't be surprising because uh, he's 60 strokes back. Um, but, yeah, I, I think regardless, the media is going to spin it that way, but I, I'm sure Liv is going to come out and say, okay, here's the bonus. You got there and you win it. Yeah, so uh, I, I kind of agree with you there. You know, the media is going to do what the media does. Um, I think that just the Liv players – being allowed after last year, you know, all we heard was that's it, but you go to live, you're not participating in this, 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 there's no if, ands, or buts. Like, and, and PGA obviously is, you know, kind of settling down on that and realizing like, Hey, look, you know, if we're going to have these tournaments where we, you know, kind of push, this is the best of the best. We need to have the best here. Let's allow these golfers, you know, to come back. Um, 
that I think that that kind of points towards, you know, some sort of, um, I don't want to use the word agreement or anything like that, but like just some sort of, I can't even think of the word. Peace. I'm trying to use here, but it's yeah, peace. peace. Yeah. Um, you know, between the two and just saying, look, like we need to have some sort of respect towards each other. If this is going to work, you have some great golfers. In my opinion, like, I don't think there's a whole lot to really build off of as far as live versus PGA. Like, obviously, you know, the way things went down kind of that. But if you think about players, in my mind, Cam Smith's really the only one that you could sit here and say, I, I think, could compete on a week to week basis. You know, obviously, they're not going to be competing week to week, but just can come in and you could say, yeah, if there's one person from live who's going to compete, it's going to be Cam Smith. Now, I get that there's names like Brooke, Brooke Kepka um, and other players like that that could compete. But when you look at last year before they went to live, they weren't really competing at the same level minus Cam Smith. Um, you know, obviously golf is golf that could change. Uh, but I, I just think that I, I think that the building box blocks are in place to kind of create this uh, union unionization, whatever between the two. But yeah, the media is going to spin it how the media is going to spin it because it's going to get viewers. Um, I, I just think that an overall feel is going to be created at least on the course that, Hey, we're the best golfers in the world. Like, Let's put this live versus whatever aside, because these guys are going to be playing side by side. You might get, you know, Rory's talked a lot of crap about live um, and he might get paired with, say, Dustin Johnson, Johnson or Cam Smith. And then at that point, like if you're going to sit there and play 18 holes where you have it in your head, like I don't like this guy because he left. It's going to ruin your game. And if and it might even help the other person's game because they know they're in your in your head. So I think that everything's there to kind of get past, you know, that petty crap when everything all started and, and to eventually be able to, you know, work together. Like I said, we got the best golfers in the world. We're going to put them out there, compete. We don't care what league they're playing in. Um, but yeah. Uh, real quick, George, I, I think that I, I kind of disagree. I think that this just fuels the fire more than allowing these players to play. I mean, you got Dustin Johnson who went and made a hundred million dollars. I think it was 120, but he over a hundred million dollars mm -hmm. to go play four rounds of golf at another league and now he can come back and get paid like i don't know seven million dollars to win the masters plus whatever bonus live throws at him mm -hmm. if you don't think that that pisses rory and anyone else off that sat in that players meeting with tiger up front being like hey we need to stick together pga is who gave you your start like what let them go do their thing they're gonna play on this other network that can't even get picked up by an actual tv you gotta watch it on youtube youtube tv whatever and and now you have this. I mean, same with Cam, like you would say, Cam Smith. Uh, uh, he went probably made another hundred million dollars going over there, and now he's back playing in the tournaments. He doesn't care about playing in the uh, these well, other tournaments. He yeah. only has I, to I'm play not in saying the than that. Yeah, I'm not saying the players aren't pissed off about it. I'm just saying they they understand they're not they they can bitch about it, but nothing's going to change. And I I think a lot of them, yeah, Roy will probably go out there and make a fuss about it. Tiger might as well, and so on. Maybe even JT and Spieth. But at some point, a lot of these guys are going to be like, okay, well, I can sit here and complain about it, or I can just go out here and play golf. And I, I think at that point, like I said, that's when the media is going to take over and just start spinning everything. And I think regardless, yeah, again, again, I don't think anybody's happy about this at all, you know, within the PGA ranks. Um, the, the live players, and again, it's not every live player. It's only the ones that have previously qualified for the Masters. So I believe it's Cam Smith, Dustin Johnson, and Mickelson are the big ones. Uh, there's going to be a few other names um, that I just don't care about. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, the players are, especially come time for the masters are going to be like, okay, listen, let's, I, I'm, I'm here to win this tournament. I don't want to focus on this. Um, you know, I, I can't make a fuss about it. Masters have made up their mind. They're, they're not going to change it at this point. Um, and I, I think they're going to go out there and they're going to try and play their best so they can, they can show again, the PGA is home of the best players in the world. And it's not over and live, you know, just cause they paid. Um, you know, some nobody who could barely make the, the, the tournaments uh, a couple hundred million dollars. Um, did you have anything else? Uh, Nick, Nick any Yeah, I was going to say, Nick, I, I was just going to throw it to Nick, but fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, so um, really what I'm looking forward to the most is uh, getting a couple questions that I have for the season answered. So those questions would be, one, can Rory carry the momentum from – what I would consider a great finish of his season, not even just winning the FedEx, but overall uh, you look back at um, the, uh, Oh God, I lost the name of it. We talked about the other day played at St. Andrews, the open, the open. Yes. Um, you know, and, and that finish that he had, uh, you know, obviously Cam Smith ended up holding him off, but from that pretty much on, 
he was up there in the conversation every week and then obviously went on to win the FedEx. Can he carry that momentum into the season and have a good season? Um, can Scotty Scheffler find consistently for consistency for longer than a month um, and put out a dominating season? Uh, which of the young talent in this field that we see in last season are, is going to continue to rise up and put their names up there with JT, Rory, Spieth, all that? And finally, probably the question that everybody's asking themselves, will it finally feel like Tiger is actually back? So that's what I'm looking forward to, getting those questions answered, maybe even adding a few more questions there. Uh, but I'm, I'm real excited. Yeah. Uh, as far as I'm go, as far as I go, a lot of the things I'm excited for this year, I think this is going to be one of the most exciting years in golf that we've had in recent. I mean, you think back, it was it was Tiger dominated for years, and then he, you know, he had his injuries, he fell off, and then Rory took over, and then Speed took over, and then it was JT, and then last year it looked like okay, it's Scheffler's turn, he's going to take over. This year we have a lot of young guys coming up. Uh, you got Zalatoris, like we talked about. We have Kim. Um, you have Max Homa, who, again, is not winning every tournament, but he always looks so good when, when he plays. He's a lot of fun. Brings a lot of eyes to the sport with his social media presence. Um, there, there's uh, – you have Cam Champ as well. Again, Cam you Young. have a lot of – Cam Young. Uh, you have a lot of these really young guys who are bringing a lot of new eyes to the sport who are fun to watch who are also really good. You know, are one of them going to have a breakout year? Like Slate said, are, are we looking at Rory, you know, on his comeback tour? Um Scheffler, can he you know, kind of reassert his dominance, get back to world number one? Is Rom ready to you know kind of, again, reassert himself and, and be one of the best in the world? I think it's going to be a very exciting throughout the whole season watching, okay, who's winning this tournament, this tournament, this tournament, uh, and, and seeing how stacked a lot of these fields all are all of a sudden. Uh, you know, the John Deere Classic, year in, year out, doesn't pull in that many big names, but all of a sudden we're going to be looking at, again, some of these up-and-coming big names that are going to be playing in that. I think every tournament is going to carry a lot of weight this year. Uh, and I think the FedEx Cup playoffs are going to be very fun to watch. Um, you know, again, with everybody stacked in there, Patrick Cantlay, again, is a name that we haven't mentioned, but he always you know, finds a way to hang around these lot of, a lot of these tournaments, win some of them. Uh, is Spieth ready to be back full time? We saw him challenge a little bit at the Masters, and then all of a sudden, rounds two through, two through three, he just fell apart completely. I think he missed the cut, actually, even uh, after like a decent first round. Um, but I, I think this is, and I might be wrong, but I think this is one of the most wide open years we're heading into. Again, with all those live guys leaving, yeah, they're going to be playing in the Masters. Are they going to be allowed in the U.S. Open or you know the other majors as well? Um, I mean, it's, I think it's all but guaranteed they won't be in the PGA Championship. But um, I think this is going to be a very fun year as far as not just majors, but every tournament. Um, and I'm I'm very excited as a whole to see where the, the golf season takes us. Um, and I think. Uh, seeing everybody come head to head in the waste management of Phoenix in a couple weeks is going to be even more fun. Um, but that will wrap up for our episode this week. Uh, we hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, again, don't forget to head over to W.GG and check out our new sponsor, W Energy. Uh, use code JackWagon for 10% off your order. Uh, so make sure you head over there and check it out. Thank you guys so much again for hanging out with us today. We hope you guys enjoy the show. We will see you next week uh, and have a great rest of your day. See you guys.